Well, hello, I am Roy Harriman with Ministry Pacific, here with our special guest, Vaughn Baker of Stratagos International. I'll tell you just a little bit about him. Vaughn is uh, based in Kansas City, Missouri, but travels the United States, sometimes the world, uh, consulting. He's the president of Stratagos International, and uh, he is a, a leading authority on really all things uh, security, uh, business security, church security. And so we are delighted to have him as a guest today. Without further ado, let me introduce our topic. Our topic is a challenging one. It is church security in an age of extremism, protecting your congregation in the era of COVID, conspiracy theorists, and societal upheaval. Uh, now that's a challenging topic, but the good news is we have a guest who is up to the task uh, Vaughn Baker, and he is the president of Stratagos International. It's an organization dedicated to protecting people and property around the globe. And he has an extensive background in law enforcement, business security, and church security. And what's important to us as well is that he is a person of personal and committed faith. So this just isn't business to him. It's personal. So Vaughn, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Roy, and uh, excited to be here. So Vaughn, we, we alluded to this at the beginning, that we live in a polarized age, and uh, vandalism against churches has reached record proportions. COVID lockdowns have created societal anxiety and disconnection. In this environment, what is the greatest physical threat to churches? That's a tough question, and just nail down to just one. Obviously, churches are dealing with anything that's going on in the world uh, is going on in churches whether you're talking about incidents of violence, whether you're talking about vandalisms, uh, sex crimes. Uh, it's, and really the reason for that is we're inviting people that are, are experiencing hurts, heartaches, and hangups and problems into our churches. And we call that outreach. And, uh, and of course, uh, when people are at their, uh, under a lot of duress, they may do things that they normally wouldn't do. And so we need to have a plan. And uh, we believe it's biblically uh, stated in multiple areas of the Bible that you should have a plan and be prepared to execute that plan uh, for safety and security for those that are there for the right reasons. Uh, to kind of expand on that, uh, we're, we're seeing a real escalation in the culture war uh, going on. And if you to think about what is the culture war, it's a, well, basically we define it as, as a conflict between groups of people that have beliefs and ideologies and uh, different core values. And uh, how those are manifesting themselves, uh, sometimes we see that in the form of extremism. And anytime you hear a word uh, by itself, uh, whether it's right wing or left wing or heterosexual or homosexual or whatever, all those are different worldviews. And none of those are, uh, are things that we need to be concerned about related to violence. But when you add that word extremist to it, those are people that are willing to do extreme acts to uh, on behalf of their ideology and uh, of course it's not enough uh, it's not okay that we just disagree uh, sometimes disagreement gets labeled as hate and of course anytime somebody feels like you hate them then they can justify lots of different things in their in their in their mind and uh, just in the last two or three years you've, you've seen this whether you think about the covid or the vax or no vax or the mask or no mask uh the, the uh, should we open churches? Should we close them? And even this week, we think about the uh, the Supreme Court leak with Roe versus Wade. All of these are issues, and all the political issues that are happening, where it, we can see the worst in people and see that manifest against people that really don't deserve that. So it's important that we have a plan uh, to prepare for those possibilities and also the realities, not just the possibility, but the realities of what we're seeing uh, frequently and regularly. Yes, what you're saying is, is absolutely true. So, for example, um, in the last year, there was a scandal uh, in Canada regarding Canadian churches that had to do with potential mistreatment of what uh, in Canada they call First Nations people or where in the United States they would call uh, Native Americans. And so there were a number of churches uh, in Canada that were set on fire and vandalized, but um, even the retribution for this even reached into the United States with churches that had absolutely nothing to do with it, even on a historical basis. So as you say, cultural events, they don't occur in, in a vacuum. They, they echo out. One of the things that you said, Vaughn, that I thought was very helpful for a, this audience of mostly churches is that 
we invite people with hangups and hurts to come join us. And that's called outreach. One thing that I know that sets you apart from a lot of people who teach about security is that you view security, church security specifically, as a ministry opportunity, not just uh, a group of people who are throwing people out into the parking lot who are misbehaving. Could you, could you possibly get into that and unpack that a little bit? I know it would be real helpful to our audience. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, like you said, we do not believe in having uh, Guido the leg breaker at the door <laughs> to, uh, to toss people out that are that maybe personally offend others or uh, Kenny. So we do believe it's a ministry base. Overall, our philosophy is this. Uh, we believe in safety and security is not only uh, the leadership's responsibility, but it's everybody's responsibility. And that we have to provide, it's very important to provide an atmosphere of safety and security without compromising the core mission of the ministry. And we generally define the core mission as to provide an atmosphere of comfort, refuge, worship, and learning. And so it doesn't matter. Uh, it'd be easy to turn your church into a prison, uh, but we are going to compromise the core mission of your ministry if we do that. So uh, we look at this as a ministry. And the bottom line is, is, is if you do it correctly, you can actually amplify the core mission uh, to provide an atmosphere of comfort, refuge, worship, and learning. So that's really our philosophy on how we provide solutions and training and consulting uh, to, our, uh, to our faith-based clients. Is, uh, is to start there and then make sure the solutions that we recommend don't compromise the core mission. Yes, I've, I've heard you speak um, regarding just the importance of this, having a team that essentially, if they do nothing else, is just attuned to being aware and observing people. And that that's even resulted in your team alerting a pastor to someone who seemed unstable and in fact, that person had, had had plans to commit suicide after the service. And because a team member cared enough to notice, that didn't happen. Absolutely. And there's so many benefits to awareness that are not including security. Uh, and you just mentioned it is, is if you're not an aware state of mind, you're going to miss ministry opportunities. And you're going to miss those people that are showing a lot of nonverbal indicators that they're hurting. And imagine missing those opportunities and finding out later that that person did, in fact, go home and commit suicide. And I give you several examples where uh, because somebody was aware, they saw those opportunities and they paid attention to that God-given discernment and that God-given nudge that, hey, this is a ministry opportunity. Security is a secondary benefit to those ministry opportunities as well. Well, Vaughn, one thing I have learned from uh, being a part and just observing many Stratagos trainings is that very little good ever comes from winging it when it when it involves security and possibly a confrontation or someone who's hostile. So I know a significant part of the work that you do is training and specifically training churches. Can you give us an overview of some of the topics uh, that you cover and why they're important to churches? We provide training and consulting along a wide variety uh, for a wide variety of audience for churches. Uh, we provide leadership training both pastoral and church security leadership and how to do planning and how to do personnel selection and risk assessments and put together a policy and procedure manual. We, we provide a one day class for that. We provide uh, a training, probably our most popular class is a training we provide for ushers, greeters, deacons, elders, parking people, uh, volunteers and church security personnel. That's our intruder awareness response course. Teaches people what suspicious activity looks like and how to respond to it if they do see it. And then also how to do a lockdown and what to do when lockdown fails. Uh, and then we have several courses that we offer for church security personnel, specifically whether they're armed or unarmed, whatever the church decides there. And uh, <clears throat> we can provide them with not only scenario-based training, but uh, weapons handling training, uh, conflict management de-escalation training, uh, firearms training, compliance and control, less lethal training, lots of different topics that we provide training specific for church security ministry teams as well. If you don't have a training on it, which it's hard to imagine something you don't have a training on, it sounds like you probably can could put together the resources to make that happen if someone had a very specific need. Yeah, we get customized requests all the time uh, where they want some, maybe a, a blend of a few of those topics uh, over a two or uh, one, two or three, four day period uh, that we customize uh, frequently for our clients. Vaughn, I don't mean to put you on the spot. And if you don't have percentages, if you just need to guess, that's fine. One of the things you mentioned was 
uh, training churches how to do a lockdown, and that is how to basically lock everybody up, close all the doors if there is a bad guy in the building. Do you have any, I mean, just to guess, what percentage of churches out there know how to do a lockdown or have a lockdown plan? Yeah, it's uh, kind of interesting how when you look at different stakeholder groups and different organizations, the emphasis on teaching people what to do if an armed intruder shows up, how that's so different. For instance, with schools, I would say uh, in, the, in the mid to high 90 percentile wow. of schools that uh, have training for lockdown and what to do when lockdown fails, uh, different types of training available. But when it t- comes to ministries and churches, that's less than 10% that have uh, that have educated their folks on how to do a lockdown. And it's just as critical in those uh, locations as well. Uh, but there's not been a big emphasis. And there's quite a few different reasons for that. We just haven't got there in terms of percentage. And some could argue that maybe there's been legislative uh, mandates uh, with schools that have caused a higher degree of preparedness uh, versus churches. Uh, but that, that's what we're seeing out in the real world. Uh, would you say that when it comes to lockdown, that it's something that every church can do? Yes, I not only could do, but it should know how to do. And uh, and I think we, when you talk about pr- protecting people's most precious asset that they have that they bring with them to church every year, it's their kids. And at least teaching the people that are t- that ha- are responsible for childcare. Uh, how to do a lockdown and what to do when lockdown fails. But uh, it'd be nice that we, we taught uh, everybody that was responsible for the care of another uh, how to do that as well. And we think that's not only uh, the right thing to do, but we're biblically obligated to do that. That's right. Well, you heard Vaughn say it. Every church can do lockdown. Every church should do lockdown. So you know what's on your list now. An issue that comes up often is uh, the use of firearms. And we're not going to talk about here, get into whether, we're not going to get into Second Amendment issues, who should have guns, who shouldn't. But an issue that often comes up and that that I've heard just kind of in, in conversations with many people in churches, hey, we don't need a security team because we've got a significant number of people here who are carrying concealed weapons or our pastor carries a concealed weapon. And, and then sometimes there's even a good amount of bravado behind it. Like, uh, oh yeah, nobody better come in here. You know, how do you evaluate a situation like that where someone says we don't need any kind of organized group because, uh, you know, (laughs) essentially our posse's already got things sewed up. Uh, One thing we know when these incidences occur is chaos is going to occur. And if we don't have a strategic, well thought out plan on how we're going to respond and, uh, and just say we hope somebody that's carrying a concealed weapon is going to be able to respond to that and also be able to hit what they're shooting at in a rapidly changing environment where they're going to be asked to make, make life and death decisions uh, in compressed time frame, split in uh, fractions of a second. Uh, you know, just simply allowing church members that have a CCW permit to carry. Uh, we see this many times after a major event. Oh, okay, everybody that bring a gun to church day. Uh, we, I've actually seen that before. And, uh, and sometimes that, that ends up being the most dangerous day in that church's history because we don't know what level of training those people have. And, of course, I, I agree with Second Amendment, uh, people's Second Amendment right to carry. But uh, doing carrying and doing so responsibly are two different things. And when we talk about life and death decisions uh, where life and death is on the line, we need to be responsible and we need to uh, have training. CCW training is primarily designed to protect yourself or your domicile. It's not designed to protect other people's in crowded environments where you're going to be asked to make those kind of decisions while uh, moving rapidly, while there's lots of people around you. And that's an advanced skill set that requires an advanced level of training. So we feel like if this is something you want to, to do and you feel like uh, that you're, you're biblically obligated or uh, constitutionally you're allowed to do so. We just say, hey, if you're going to do it, uh, we completely agree with that. But let's do it responsibly in a way that honors God with excellence. And, and that means preparing in advance. Yes. Uh, you talked about uh, concealed carry training and the kind of training uh, that's necessary to respond 
in a, a very public crowded environment with a firearm, well, would you call that um, police training or tactical training? And, and how can someone get that kind of training? Well, there's lots of places you can get uh, that kind of, I wouldn't call, we, we do, uh, sometimes it gets referred to as tactical training. Uh, many times people say, well, unless it's policemen, they shouldn't carry a gun. And uh, we don't look at it as if they're law enforcement or not. We look at it as if they're trained or not. And uh, the only difference between law enforcement and some people that carry weapons is law enforcement trained. But there's, I can give you many instances where law enforcement doesn't have as much training. And I can say this as current and former law enforcement myself. They don't have near uh, as much training as, as many people on the civilian side has chosen to invest in themselves. So uh, it's not about if they're law enforcement or not. It's just about if they're trained or not. Excellent insight. Training is the key. And so if your church um, is serious about having firearms as part of its security ministry, it needs to invest uh, in advanced training. Um, Stratagos International provides that training, and I'm, I'm sure if you would be able to recommend others if people weren't able to make the connection with Stratagos because of the geography or something else. Absolutely. We, uh, we base our training programs, firearms related on Second Chronicles, and it talked about the excellence that David Warriors had, David's Warriors had, the Warriors of Ziklag, that they had the ability to, to shoot bows and arrows and throw spears with both their right and their left hand. So we really believe in having a bilateral capability. That means with either hand uh, and also one-handed or two-handed. It's called a handgun, not a hands gun. Uh, so uh, our course, uh, four-day course, you're going to fire 1,200 rounds, moving forward, backward, laterally, left and right, standing, kneeling, modified prone uh, with one hand and two hand uh, in both hands. So um, it's, it's an advanced level course, and you're going to get lots of uh, repetition to uh, enhance your skill sets. Yeah, I've had the privilege of observing that. And uh, it's, it's very impressive and uh, rigorous and, and safe. You have, again, obviously people looking out for, for safety. And well, I, uh, I just have a short related component. Again, my name is Roy Harriman and with Ministry Pacific. And we're very interested in this topic because our goal is to protect churches from risk. So one, the risk of an intruder coming in and harming the congregation and so that's why we're here talking about church security. But second, uh, alluding to the last question, um, we do not want to see people engaging in what we could call freelance church security. That is no plan, uh, no oversight, uh, no safety precautions, because that will elevate the level of risk instead of lowering it. All you have to do is do a Google search about church shootings. Some of them happen from within the congregation. So uh, it's good to know that it's critical to know that the training you're doing is helpful. So as Vaughn is saying, uh, training and planning and leadership are essential to coming out alive on the other side of the crisis. And so if you follow uh, his lead, you're going to reduce risk. I want to share a couple options for you to explore that can complement a church security team. They don't uh, replace it, but they can complement and enhance it. Uh, one is called active shooter insurance. And the situation that this covers is if there is, God forbid, a violent incident at your church and someone is harmed, they can sue you for negligence. And in that instance, you're going to have to provide a legal defense, regardless of whether you did everything right or wrong. If you're sued, you still have to provide a legal offense. Active shooter insurance helps fund that legal defense. A related coverage is catastrophic insurance, which funds counseling and other services related to recovering from a traumatic event. And these things are not part of uh, standard liability insurance, which to vastly oversimplify that is slip and fall insurance. Uh, there are things that you may want to consider uh, adding to your policy. And so we encourage you, whatever security plan you land on, check in with your insurer and make sure that what you are doing is decreasing risk and not e increasing it. So just a few options to consider along with all the great information that Vaughn is sharing. And I want to go back to Vaughn. Vaughn, a legitimate concern that I've heard shared many times about church security is that the presence of a security team will scare people away. What are your thoughts? 
Well, before I get to that, I, I do want to kind of expand on your insurance uh, sure. discussion there. Uh, you know, at, we always say after the first fight, you had the second fight. The first fight is the crisis, and the second fight is litigation. Uh, and you can do everything right and get sued. So uh, having solutions for that second fight uh, to reduce your risk profile is really critical. So we really believe in that. I'm glad you offered some great solutions there. Uh, Thank you. To, to answer your question about uh, the presence of church security teams, does that scare people away? It can. If you do it incorrectly, uh, yeah, you can scare people away or make people feel uncomfortable. Uh, but we say this. We say if you do it correctly, which is how we really believe and we teach, uh, your church should become a more friendly place, not a less friendly place. Uh, and now we have people, more people that are aware, that are trained, and are looking for ministry opportunities, looking for people that maybe look lost. Uh, maybe it's a larger church and they've never been there before, or even a mid-sized church, they don't know where to go. And we see those, because we're in a aware state of mind, we see those opportunities to serve someone. So uh, if you do it correctly, it should become a more friendly place, not a less friendly place. Now, as far as scaring people away, uh, that sometimes occurs when you do it correctly. What I mean by that is people that are up to no good. Uh, <laughs> we we uh, sometimes implement a principle we call aggressive friendliness. And uh, if we see somebody that's obviously there for the wrong reasons, maybe they're looking to uh, to steal assets, laptops, or other hardware they see laying around or a purse laying around, uh, we take turns going up and being friendly with those folks. And uh, it's kind of the same principle as why Walmart put greeters in place. Uh, it reduces shoplifting because people don't want to re be remembered. They, they want to stay self-isolated. They don't want to be recognized. So when you go up and you take turns being friendly with them, uh, many times you'll scare those people away as well. So that sometimes is a benefit uh, where you don't ever have to take action. Uh, it's just a deterrent aspect. A related question. Do you have a p an opinion on should the security team, should they blend into the background and essentially be unnoticeable? Um, should they have a badge? Sometimes people will also bring in a, a uniformed police officer. Is, is there one benefit to one approach over another? Yeah, there's pros and cons to each. Uh, for instance, non-uniformed, a passive presence, uh, the people that are in plain clothes that maybe have some sort of passive identification that they're part of the security team. We, for instance, use the, uh, the protectors pin, the lapel pin. That's a passive identification. Mm -hmm. uh, those people can monitor suspicious activity without being observed more easily. Uh, sometimes if you want a uniform presence, it does allow for somebody that's looking for directions or looking for help. Now we have somebody that they, they can approach and, and ask for help from. And sometimes the, the uniform person will provide a visual deterrence. So there's some pros and some uh, cons of both of those. Uh, and, and many times we'll see uh, with security teams that are very effective, you'll see a combination of both where you'll see uniformed and non-uniformed folks. You may see non-uniformed in their security team. You may see uniformed folks in the form of off-duty police officers like you just mentioned. So there's pros and cons to each. And, and uh, we, we try to stay away from saying always or never. Uh, those are big words, and uh, there's applications and benefits and negatives for both of those. There's not this cookie cutter approach. Every church, every culture is different, and you can adapt to that. And you can you can still do something instead of nothing. Starting with nothing, many churches have uh, nothing in terms of any kind of formal church security. Um, if you're a church, you've got uh, like all churches whether you're a mega church or you're a small church struggling to get by, uh, you're struggling for volunteers. And how can we possibly do one more thing? Um, so if you're at ground zero in terms of church security, um, what would you advise a church like that? How can they get started uh, and take a step forward without being overwhelmed and feeling like they have to do everything? It is a one bite at a time or a one step at a time process because uh, putting it in place is going to take some time. It's going to take some commitment, but the, the one step you're in front of the, the other step is, is one step in the right direction you are. So it starts with, first of all, awareness and recognizing the need. Uh, you know, since 1999, we've seen almost a 2,400% increase in violence in churches. In the last decade alone, we've seen a 600% of increase in violence in churches. So we know there's a need. 
So what do we do about it once we see that need and we've overcome that what we call the big D, this idea of denial, the denial that we don't need that here. It can't happen here. Sometimes we hear people say it can't happen here. Well, we're in a small town. It can't happen. Well, and don't tell the people in West Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, in a one room schoolhouse or uh, Sutherland Springs, Texas, population 400 and the whole town 50 at this church where 26 were killed and 20 were wounded, that it can't happen in a small town. It's happening everywhere, big, big cities and small cities, both. After you've accepted that we want to do something and we need to do something, we feel obligated to do something, then we start off we usually with doing a risk assessment. Where are our areas of risk related to different types of crisis and different types of needs, whether they're man-made crisis or they're natural crisis of medical emergencies and, and severe weather and things of that nature. Uh, we know you cannot conduct a good risk assessment without accepting risk. You can't assess risk until you accept it. And uh, all churches have some level of risk. Part two of that would be establishing what your goals and objectives are for your safety and security ministry are. We do a goals and objectives questionnaire when we come in and do a weekend consult and we help the, the, uh, ministry establish what their goals and objectives are. If we know their goals and objectives, then we can recommend solutions that will allow them to achieve their goals and objectives. And, and then, uh, and then all, as part of that, we will do a physical security assessment where we, we will outline what we feel like their opportunities for improvement from physical security point of view are, and we can make recommendations for improvement. And then the third part of that would be uh, outlining an overall philosophy biblically on how we're gonna conduct ourselves as a safety and security ministry and then include within that not only policies and procedures, personnel selection, a training plan, and then uh, how we're going to uh, deploy our human resources and our technological resources. So that's usually the three steps that we recommend. Yeah, what I'm what I'm hearing you say really is that uh, knowledge is power, and uh, you don't just start doing things. You you start uh, not not from the uh, paralysis of analysis necessarily, but by looking at hey, what are what are some real possibilities of, uh, uh, of threats here? What are the, maybe the greatest potential for risks that could happen? And what are some things that we could begin doing? I know we don't have time to get into this today, but I'll just add it before I give you another question. What, what I understand about Stratagos is they do not delineate necessarily this hard line between a security team and everyone else. The idea is that everyone is trained at least in awareness uh, so that they can be eyes and ears for the pastor. So the usher isn't like, well, I don't, I don't do that. I'm not on the security team as they see someone, you know, nervously fidgeting about in the lobby. Um, the, the children's, uh, the children's team, they're aware of, uh, there's a parent dropping off a, a, a child seemingly under duress. You train everyone to develop uh, awareness skills so that again, the entire burden doesn't rest on one person who can only be in one place at, at, at one time. Yeah, that's the single biggest step any ministry can take to increase safety and security is to increase awareness. Uh, it's not just the security ministry's job for safety and security. It's everybody's responsibility. And uh, if, you, if you are a person uh, that's responsible for the care of another, then you have an obligation to prepare in advance. And, uh, and the first step of that is, is increasing your, your uh, skill sets and the, the idea of awareness. Very helpful. And some excellent questions here we're going to address in just a minute. I Talking about preparedness, you have uh, a very unique uh, training opportunity coming up. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about, about that? Yes, uh, and this will be our third year we've done this. Uh, in addition to the 200 plus, 250 plus courses that we do across the country, uh, each year during the late summer or fall, we do what we call, uh, conduct what we call the National Christian Protectors Conference. And this year will be a two-day event in Kansas City, Missouri, centrally located. And we're going to have not only guest speakers uh, to provide not only uh, spiritually motivating beacon engage, uh, engagements, but also we're going to have a lot of training sessions, breakout sessions, uh, where over two-day period, people will have the opportunity to attend multiple training sessions. And uh, for a small investment, they can... Uh, can, can really get a lot out of increasing their, not only their skill sets, but also really be edified by some really powerful um, spirit-filled believers uh, that fall into that category of being protectors. And, and very, very, uh, we've seen some uh, real fruit that's come out of this conference, people that were really uh, professional protectors, law enforcement, fire, 
EMS military folks. Maybe they were struggling. Their marriages were falling apart. And I had one guy last year came up, stopped me in the hallway. And he says, man, you've got me fired up. I'm going home to save my marriage. And uh, man, that's just, that's just to hear that we had, we've each year, we've had multiple people that have prayed to receive Christ and they can understand, they understand that, Hey, you can be a believer uh, in, in, and also be a police officer or military. And uh, in fact, I, I really believe you cannot achieve your potential unless you have got supernatural uh, God given wisdom and skill sets that only he can provide. Uh, you'll never maximize your potential as being a protector. So we're excited about this third year. Uh, we've already got over 250 people registered. And uh, it's, uh, if you want to go to our website, you can check that out at strategosintl.com and click on conference. And you can see all the speakers. We've got some real powerful, uh, well-known speakers that are going to be there. Excellent. And in addition to helping people who are already in the security or the life-saving business, we'll send essentially someone who is entry level on this. Maybe they're a member of the clergy or a volunteer. Uh, will this be a benefit to them? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, we'll, we have training breakout sessions for both those that are armed protectors as well as those that are unarmed uh, that are just part of a maybe a children's ministry. Uh, but especially the speaking engagements, anybody's uh, w- will get a lot out of those and really be inspired and fired up uh, to. And we all need that to be energized uh, uh, at times uh, when we're fighting the daily fight of spiritual warfare. So uh, this would be a good opportunity for anybody who wants to attend. Very helpful. So I have one last formal question, then we're going to start taking some of these excellent chat questions. Mm -hmm. And that is, this is the the radio talk show question. I I know because you've told me you've received it on a number of um, uh, programs that you've been on where people are interviewing you. And that in, in this question, I don't think most likely is going to be of direct benefit to people who are on this uh, webinar with us today because they're already interested in church security. They're already convinced or they wouldn't be here. But a number of people share some theological or even philosophical reasons as to why they do not want their church to engage uh, in a church security ministry. Um, one of them uh, is, well, we're pacifist. Uh, we believe that we shouldn't resist. Um, and so it's more of a, uh, and I'm not here to say that that's right or wrong, but it's, it's more of, a, of an application of the Sermon on the Mount um, and the idea, turn your cheek universally. So we're not going to resist. So it would be wrong for us to have a security ministry. And then the other item is uh, an appeal to the sovereignty of God. And that is, well, we believe God's going to protect us so for us to do anything uh, would be a presumption on our part because he's protecting us. Um, and this may be something that a, a pastor or an elder board has really struggled with. Um, and I know you have to address that often. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm doing one at a time. Uh, we actually have a whole section in our leadership course that's titled Overcoming Objections to Protecting the Flock. And most of the objections that we've received over the years have been biblically based. And uh, so, and, and, and many times, of course, as, as anyone on this call knows, so important when you're talking about uh, cherry picking a verse here and there, that context is included in that. Uh, the pacifist objection, uh, I want everybody to understand what a pacifist is. A pacifist is somebody who's opposed to violence. Uh, the Christian pacifist is opposed to violence by, based on their religious conviction. They believe Jesus was a pacifist. And that because he, they believe he was, then we should be as well. But when you look at that definition of somebody who's opposed to violence, well, then my first question to that person is, well, if you're opposed to violence, tell me what you're willing to do about it if you see violence taking place against somebody who have, doesn't deserve it. If you're not going to do anything to stop it, then I do not believe you're opposed to violence. Uh, you make, make, may make a good witness, but that doesn't mean you're a pacifist in my view. Uh, if you're opposed to violence or opposed to anything, you're willing to do something about it. Uh, so uh, that's the first thing when we talk about pacifists. Uh, as far as Jesus being a pacifist, I can give instances where he was a pacifist. I can also give uh, instances in the Bible where he wasn't a, a pacifist. But usually I'll end that conversation when I tell them, well, let's see what he is when he comes back, because uh, he's not going to be a pacifist then. Uh, so uh, that's the other way we can address that. As far as the 
well, we believe in God's going to protect us. What we just need to pray more. And if it, and I've actually seen this on on social media, where people that say, well, if it happens in your church, you just haven't prayed enough. Well, that's very very hurtful, and it's not biblical, uh, but it's very hurtful for the places where it has happened. And many people were victimized by saying, well, they just weren't spiritually mature, and that's why it happened in their church. Uh, and, and it's not even realistic. Uh, so we talk about that. We, we like to use other verses as well. One of them is Proverbs 22, 3, a wise man foresees danger and he prepares in advance. Pretty clear. Uh, Matthew 10, 16, behold, I send you out of sheep amongst wolves, therefore be as wise as serpents, which means prepare in advance and harmless as doves. And we prepare in, a, in advance in a way that doesn't compromise the core mission, which is what we've talked about. I can give verses Acts 20, 28 through 31, uh, give quite a few different verses that talk about uh, where Jesus tells us to prepare in advance because persecutions are coming. And we, we should opt. And, and uh, usually those people that say, well, Jesus is going to protect them. I'll ask them, well, do you wear your seatbelt? And uh, well, yeah, I wear my seatbelt. Well, then you're not living it out what you really believe. Or do you lock your doors at night? Or do you uh, leave your kids in an unlocked house at night? Uh, so we, we, we bring up all those common sense, uh, arguments when we talk about these, these discussions, um, uh, regarding, is this the right thing to do biblically or not? And, uh, we, nobody is going to convince me now this is not the right thing to do biblically, especially in the times that we're living in, because I cannot, I would not be able to live with myself if I watched somebody else get victimized and I had the skill sets and the desire to do something about it, and I did nothing. Uh, I just wouldn't be able to live with myself. And again, um, to to echo your philosophy that there are many ways to provide church security. You could have an exclusively unarmed team, but if someone's committed to locking the door, um, that could save a life. Uh, if someone's just simply looking around and sees the the need to lock a door, if you uh, know that there is an uh, estranged husband who has lost custody of his children, you see him storming through the parking lot, you know, you need to take action. Uh, that, that doesn't mean you have to have a marksman on staff, right? So it's, it's, it, it's this all or nothing things I think can set us back from making a difference. Yes. I've seen very effective church security ministries that have chosen not to be armed. They can deal with everything else up to the point of an armed intruder, uh, the medical emergencies, the, uh, the protester, the disgruntled church member or former church member, Lots of things that those folks can deal with uh, and, uh, it, without having an armed response. One of the original questions, um, this one is from Juan Carlos, and we're going to do our best here. Um, we don't have all the answers, but uh, Juan says, our services are in Spanish. Sometimes we get guests who don't speak Spanish, and most of the time we don't know their intentions. How can we handle this without being rude or making uh, someone someone, someone be unnecessarily offended. Any thoughts on that one? Sure. Well, when we're educating people on awareness, uh, we do that by asking people to identify the normal in their environment, in their worship environment. What is the normal behavior? Once you know the normal, then you start uh, looking for the abnormal. Well, somebody can't speak Spanish and there's a, they're attending. My first thought might be not that they're a bad person, but hey, can we serve them somehow? Maybe a translator, maybe we have a headset with translation services, or we go up to them and we try to communicate with them. If we have somebody that can speak some English uh, in, in a way to see if there's some way we can serve them. We, we learn a lot about people when we're willing to go up and visit with them and about what their needs are. Uh, now, if you go up and ask them to introduce yourself and you say, Hey, my name's Vaughn. Uh, what's your name? And they, uh, 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 well, my name's John, John. Now. Yeah, that's my name, John. Well, that's an unusual response. So, uh, but we have to be willing to go up and, and greet people. And uh, I tell security personnel all the time, if they see something out of the ordinary, just go up and turn into a greeter. You just happen to be a greeter with a gun if you're armed. So uh, that's really the mindset that we want our security personnel to have or anybody in there. How can we serve this person? And we can learn a lot about what their, uh, their intentions are as well as their needs both. Absolutely. As I've heard you say many times, how can I help you or can I help you? is a much more winsome approach to someone who might be on the margin than what are you doing? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Von Christopher DeRue says, um, 
congregation consists, the vast majority of whom are older members, and they're really not up to handling firearms or any kind of physical confrontation, what kind of security environment can they create? How can they approach that? Well, educating them one, uh, if we do have, if obviously we have people in our churches and we, in the, all churches have this, that we put in the category of high risk, low mobility. And not only would that be uh, people that maybe have physical limitations, but people that are seniors, as well as young kids and babies and infants, uh, those are high risk, low mobility. So we obviously we can't evacuate those folks. It's not, if we do, it's not going to happen quickly. Uh, but we have to be prepared to have a plan to protect them, whether that's through lockdown or whether that's through an armed, uh, trained, effective uh, protector response. The instance of an elderly congregation, um, everyone can be trained to be observant and to be alert, right? And, and, and when you're in that, when you're able to do that, you perhaps can ward off a significant percentage of, of, of risks that will never materialize because you were observant. And in those, in those cases where we have an older demographic, it's really important that our awareness piece starts in the parking lot because uh, we can recognize we got a problem heading into the building. Then we can lock down before they make it into the building. So uh, the security and awareness presence has to start in the parking lot. We call it from the parking lot to the pulpit. And so uh, most of these major attacks have started in the parking lot. So that's why we need to start our awareness in the parking lot. Kenneth has a question here that you addressed to some degree, but he said, are there any statistics that break down the incidences of violence, um, for example, uh, rural versus urban versus suburban? Well, uh, I can talk about the incidents of the violent crimes that have occurred, the motives behind those. The number one motive is robbery. And uh, the one statistic that would surprise you is more than about 61% of the time, these incidents at churches are occurring during the week. It's not even during services or special events. So if our plan is just to have safety and security uh, initiatives working during services and special events, and we forget about during operations during the week, we're not even covering the majority. The majority are happening during the week. So that's an important statistic. One of the other statistics that people talk about is what denominations are experiencing this the most. Well, statistics don't really help you much there. Uh, we know that non-denominational and Baptists have the highest incident of violence in churches. Well, that's only because there's more Baptist and more non-denominational churches than there are other denominations. So there's more opportunity uh, for those. As far as urban versus suburban, uh, you have different types of crimes in each of those areas. The urban area might be bleed over from other types of crimes. Uh, I know there's a church in Kansas City conducting a high-risk funeral. It was a gang-related funeral. Well, a, a rival gang drove by and did a drive-by shooting inside the church. Dozens of rounds fired into the church during the funeral. Uh, during their risk assessment, they, it would be important for them to recognize this is a high-risk uh, high risk funeral because it is the victim is a gang member, a former gang member, or it's alleged that he was a gang member. So there might be retaliation involved. So it's important we have uh, a plan in place there as well. So uh, as far as urban versus suburban, it's happening everywhere. It's not more in the suburbs or more in the urban. There's just different types of crimes that happen in each of those areas, violent crimes. Great point about uh, burglaries, whereas the burglar doesn't necessarily, his intention isn't to hurt someone. But if there's someone there, all bets are off. Absolutely. I can give you an incident in, the, um, where was it? Arlington, Texas, where it was a robbery during the week with a pastor pastor was suffocated with a trash bag and he was killed in a, in a, in a pastor secretary was beaten almost to death. Uh, and that was robbery related. And, and then a burglary that happened in Anna, Illinois, just across state line from Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Uh, we had a church female custodian and a secretary that were beaten almost to death during a burglary where they, they uh, ended up stumbling across the attackers, 80 year old female in Arkansas, Northeast of, of uh, Little Rock, uh, she forgot something. The church was closed. She went back into the church a few hours later to get something. She interrupted the burglary and they beat her to death with the cross that was on the altar of the church. So just gets you a lot, lot of examples where nonviolent crimes end up turning violent because, because of, uh, they're worried about witnesses. Well, those are, those are disturbing. Um, and um, another reason that we're having this conversation today, um, you mentioned during the week, 
And then I want to grab a couple of these other questions before we wind down here and we will close, uh, have a hard close it at one o'clock, but everybody's got to make their own rules. But if anybody can walk in the church during the week, then, and I know we're more concerned about people than property, but anything can then walk out the door, right? Well, we call that stewardship. How are we going to protect the assets that we've been blessed with? And, uh, Part of that is during the week, who are we going to allow in our church buildings? And so we talk about and advise our clients frequently on access control and the importance of screening people, both audibly and visually through technology solutions, camera and, and intercom, before we allow them into our building. Not only protect our assets, but also our people. Uh, it becomes more important depending on what your your, cri- your criminal de- demographic is in your area. So uh, yeah, and, and what you're talking about as far as property crimes is just being a good steward of what we've been blessed with. Very helpful. One other question from Ken Kenneth, and he's looking for online resources that can help, he says, our parish increase their awareness and recognize the importance of the need to focus on church security. Sure. Yeah, we, uh, we usually recommend Department of Homeland Security has several resources for faith-based organizations on how to prepare, whether that's risk assessments, whether that's template policies and procedures. Uh, We we can assist you on that. Uh, As far as uh, if you want to contract with us, we can obviously assist you with that. Many of your insurance companies have lots of resources that can assist you uh, and that are value added, no cost additional resources. uh, If you want to check with your church insurance company as well. Great question. And uh, a comment here uh, from Patricia. Um, when you were, Von, you were addressing the God will protect me, um, she, she says that uh, sometimes God protects us by making sure we have knowledge and training. I'm, uh, and that's right in so many areas, right? Uh, it would be wonderful if uh, uh, spiritually, theologically, intellectually, we could just uh, uh, set that book on our head when we slept, right? But uh, a lot of times God asks us to roll up our sleeves and, and do some work. And then our last couple of questions here. And I think we're going to go with our last question uh, from Gary. Thank you. And he says, could you please discuss the need for a policy as well as a plan? Well, I think Gary, you hit the nail on the head. It's not just a policy. It's a written policy. And uh, I had actually had a pastor one time attend and he goes, well, we have a plan and a policies, but we don't put them in writing. And I said, really, why is that? And uh, he says, well, if we put them in writing, then we have to follow them. And uh, I'm like, well, you got me there. You do have to follow them them in writing. Uh, But the whole purpose of why we put them in writing is we want to be able to to provide it. Because like I said, the second fight is the litigation fight. We want to be able to demonstrate we took reasonable effort to prevent harm and that we had a well-planned, well-thought-out approach in advance and that we weren't just winging it. You're going to get accused of that. And you want to be able to defend those accusations by saying, no, we had, a, we had a plan in writing. We had policies in writing. Now, remember what policies are. They're guidelines. They're not absolutes. There's always exceptions to policies, but they're meant as guidelines. Uh, and, and the whole benefit of them is to train your people on how they should respond or if they should respond, depending on if we're talking about laying hands on people. So uh, that's the purpose and benefit for why we have these in writing so we can defend ourselves later. And it provides a, a much greater opportunity for success when uh, chaos is happening if we've trained people on how to respond to those particular uh, man-made or natural hazards and events. And uh, it's also an excellent opportunity for training your team, you know, bringing them. I mean, everybody goes through it once, but then six months, nine months, 18 months pass. There hasn't been any training. People, we all tend to drift. If it's already down in, in the, the policies down here, hey, this is how we're going to handle it. It's, it's a built-in opportunity to refresh people on, on what needs to be done. Absolutely. As far as uh, some other questions about further resources, um, certainly you can connect um, with, uh, with Vaughn and his team at Stratagos uh, using the contact information that we're sharing here. And um, I will mention this as well. Vaughn has a book called The Church Security Handbook, which you can purchase through his website. Can you still purchase it through Amazon? Uh, Yes, absolutely. You can download it on Amazon or in a printed format. Uh, And it's a short book for lay people, uh, a great way to get started um, and then uh, follow up. So 
one thing I've heard Vaughn say, and I want to allow him to kind of close us out with this is create a ministry, but then keep on improving it, keep learning and keep growing. Absolutely. And uh, the other thing we close out with is we say, we hope everything you've learned is a waste of time and it's never needed, but we've already talked about uh, biblically, we are obligated to, to uh, prepare in advance for these types of issues. We wish we didn't have to, there will be a time we won't have to prepare for safety and security issues. But as long as we're here on this, this particular time frame on earth, uh, we are going to have to uh, prepare for these kind of issues and it's only going to get worse. How do I know that? Well, the Bible tells me so. Uh, it's going to get, these issues are going to get worse. And, and uh, so we need to prepare. Well, Vaughn, thank you. This has been uh, very helpful. And again, everybody who is uh, with us today will receive a link to this and we'll be sharing it far and wide. Please share it far and wide. The more people that know about it, the better. And uh, at Ministry Pacific, we appreciate you, you joining us today. We want to be a resource to you. We want to help you to manage risk. We want to make sure that whatever, as to echo what Vaughn said, uh, whatever precautions you put in place, we hope you never have to actualize them and never have to do that lockdown uh, for real. But it can give you a sense of peace and confidence knowing that you are ready. And I think uh, as someone who has served on a church staff for a number of years, frees you to not have to worry about that because you know you've got systems in place and people in place who are focusing on security and well-being. So you can work with children or you can uh, get the music team ready or you can work on your message. Well, Vaughn, thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you to everybody for joining us. Uh, let us know how we can serve you at Ministry Pacific. And I know Stratagos will be eager to hear from you as well. And that's all we have. Thank you so much. 